Welcome everyone to the Motive Podcast. My name is Shaden Bertinoli. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, but really uh, anymore, I tell people that I'm a men's mental health therapist and I gotta, I can't lie, I'm feeling, feeling a ton of emotion, man. I think I'd rather just be your therapist. <laughs> um, I'm here with my coach. I'm here with a new friend, um, brother named Eric Thompson. And uh, I don't even know where to start uh, as I've thought about this podcast. Uh, so just to give a heads up, um, for many of you listeners, you might not know a bit of my story, but uh, when I was 18, I woke up one morning and, and uh, my mom and dad said, hey, we need to talk to you and uh came up the stairs and my my dad looked me in the eyes and looked our family in the eyes and said he had this disease called Lou Gehrig's disease ALS and uh, he said yeah, you have a couple years to li- I have a couple years to live and uh it changed my life and uh so then I was a, I actually served him I went on my mission after that and so I didn't get to see my dad's digression if you will I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get to see him go from where he was to where he was when I came home. And so now I meet Eric and, uh, my coach in seventh grade and, and, uh, sadly he was given the same news a while back and he's going to share more of our story, his story about that. But if it's just an incredible, in my opinion, tender mercy, no, no coincidences about it that you're in my life. Um, and I, and I, I've wanted to capture our ta- our conversations on, in our podcast. And um, because I, I did not get to experience my dad's time while he went through a lot of the stuff that you're going through right now. And I, I want to be able to share that with other people too. So yeah, thanks right. for being here. You got it. Hopefully we can, um, not cry too much. I know. This thing. <laughs> give, I'll give Eric a heads up. So he's a pretty uh, sensitive guy anyway, but there's a, there's this interesting side effect of, of Lou Gehrig's disease that in, it impacts your, your crying and your laughter. Everything else is pretty much physical in the disease, but, but there's this oddity about it that affects your, your emotions in that way. And so, yeah, he'll be tearing up a little bit, but he also is a pretty sensitive guy as it is. Yeah. It was bad news for me. I already cry and laugh pretty easy and and wear my emotions on my sleeve and now supposedly the part of the brain that regulates that is you know diminished and and you cry a lot easier and laugh a lot easier so hopefully we can make it through it but anyone that knows me knows so yeah well thanks for being here yeah and i again i just want to check in with myself because i you know i any of you listeners you know i'm pretty raw on my podcast and and it's, it's neat for me to feel this man. Like I am so much often in the role of just sitting with people as more of the helper. And, and I think my brain goes to a different place when I do that. And so just to feel it more open of, of like two, two men just connecting and talking, you know, to help other men, it's pretty beautiful. And, uh, and obviously I, I think I shared this with you, but after our first, after our first session, um, you walked out of my office and I, um, I just fell on the ground behind my couch and just wept. Um, sorry, I'm not trying to make you cry, I promise. <laughs> but I just wept. Um, and you helped me. You helped me feel some stuff I needed to feel that I haven't been able to feel in like 16 years. And so I appreciate that. I felt a compassion for my dad that I haven't been able to tap into before. So I appreciate that, man. And that's what I hope you can help other people do today just by sharing whatever you have to share too. Um, yeah, was, um, I don't know if it's, I don't think there's a coincidence. I think it's a little divine intervention that I'm even here because um, I've really been diagnosed and you know believed to possibly have ALS for about almost seven years now and you know during that time I've been highly encouraged to seek counseling Um, in fact the last time I was at the U of U well maybe about six months ago they were a little worried because I was like the only person who has ALS Um, for this long it wasn't seeing counseling um, that they were seeing and 
were asking me about it. You know, I'm pretty, you know, I probably have that attitude of, you know, I'm tough. I don't need that. And I really have great parents and a support system with my wife and kids and a football team and friends where I felt I was, I was fine. And, you know, and probably a little bit like I, you know, like I'm, I'm tough. I don't need that. So anyway, I had, I had a, you know, a bishop and a friend um, when I mentioned to him that I was thinking about it, um, mentioned that, that he knew someone whose, you know, father had ALS and maybe that would be a connection. So that kind of was what motivated me that someone would be able to understand. And then, you know, we found out, oh, I coached this kid <laughs> in seventh grade and, and my dad coached his dad and we have a connection there as well as just similar, you know, likes and interests. So, yeah, so it's been good for me to be able to share. Um, but I'm, I'm a pretty sharing person anyway. But, um, you know, the some of the darkness and sadness. That, you know, comes with, you know, anybody that's struggling with anything, but particularly, uh, you know, a terminal disease is something I didn't want to burden others with. So there's probably a lot that I would keep inside. So it's been good to, you know, unload that on you a little bit. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's been a really good experience for me. So um, that's the first thing I would say is I think I'm pretty tough. And if, you know, counseling or having someone to talk to can help me, I think it can help anybody. Thanks, man. I agree. Men struggle. They struggle to give yeah. themselves permission to do it. Let's go to tough real quick. Yeah, let's do it. What do you, how do you define, well, how did you define toughness before? Maybe the, the di like diagnosis and what's, what have you been, what have you learned about toughness since? Yeah. You know, that one has been brought up. I've had to sp speak about it a few times and been on my mind a lot. And, and I think, you know, most people, myself included, you know, toughness is when things get hard, you know, you just, you just keep going and you grind and, you know, it doesn't matter how hard it is, you know, you keep pushing forward and, you know, hey, I can do this. And, you know, I, I felt that in that way that I did have some toughness, kind of that, you know, people refer to that as grit sometimes, that old school grit that, you know, you persevere and you keep pushing uh, no matter how hard something is. And, you know, we all, especially I think men, we strive to be that, you know, that type of person. I think that's, you know, very valuable um, in your life in many respects. But um, the more I've, you know, learned about it, studied it, heard things about, you know, real toughness, that there's another, I know, another side to it, to grip. That, you know, we all we're going to deal with something that we can do by ourselves that our own toughness level, especially, you know, physically, mentally, um, that we can't handle. It. So, you know, reaching out for help and developing, you know, skills or a mindset that you can deal with hard things, I think is really valuable. In fact, um, I heard someone talk about it recently, a coach, um, that, you know, a lot of players, I think we do this as people too. Well, this is hard right now. And this feeling of, well, if I can just get through this, then life will be easier and I'll be okay. And we kind of, as people have a constant, I think, you know, search to try to find to make life easier and maybe prayers and hopes that things will be easier for us. And that that's not, really ever going to work out because things are always going to continue to be hard. You might get through something and you can kind of take a breath, but then something else is going to come up, whether that's, you know, as a student, an athlete, a, a father, a, you know, employee, whatever, things are going to come up in your life. So, you know, maybe having the, the prayer and trying to develop a mindset that you're going to be able to handle hard things instead of wishing and hoping things were easier because that also 
because that's never really going to happen or work out how you want. So I think that's where, you know, the feeling sorry for yourself and resentment and anger. Hey, things aren't as hard for this person as me, or why do I have to deal with this? Or I already dealt with this hard thing, and I have another hard thing to deal with. Instead of, you know, realizing a lot of those things are out of your control, and how do I have a mindset that I can have grit and, you know, learn to deal with hard things. And I think as we learn to deal with hard things well, then it's not... <laughs> You know, I would say, you know, that's the irony of my situation is that every day is hard. You know, medically, there's, you know, my body gets weaker um, and it gets more difficult every day. So there's never a time where like, oh, I got through this, tomorrow will be better, easier. It's, you know, it's always harder. But I feel that. I don't feel that things are as hard um, as I thought they would be or as they used to be. So, you know, I think learning to deal with hard things with a, with a healthy mindset, um, you know, building that grit has been really important to me. Um, you know, well, how do you do that? I guess that's maybe something we can, you know, talk yeah. about and get your, your perspective on as well. But I did have the thought of maybe we should, I just thought my, what's so familiar to me and you with ALS I, did, I didn't I took I didn't take a second in the beginning to even talk about yeah like so do you do you want me to explain ALS or do you think you yeah you go ahead to? man because I might get emotional so <laughs> so amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is uh what ALS stands for and then um one of the more famous baseball players for the Yankees named Lou Gehrig was was one of the first uh, I guess public figures to have been diagnosed with it, so it kind of brought on this uh, nickname, Lou Gehrig's disease, and and so what it does really, uh, it 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 it's a let's see, you got to help me, immune disorder, neuro, well, it's an immune disorder, right? No, neuro. Tell me more about. Yeah, that. I mean, I'm, I get back, I go they, back and forth. I think they still struggle with it, and like they consider it a neurological disease. Some people think it, it's an like auto, autoimmune. autoimmune. Uh, because it's really one of the few diseases on earth still that they have no reason why you get it. They don't know what yep. brings it on. They have nothing that slows it down or that really cures it. And, you know, so there's probably still a, you know, debate there. Is this uh, something with your, you know, your own immune system that brought it on? Or is it yep. you know, just something that was in your genes that gets brought out at a certain time in your life? Um, but either way, yeah, it's like, a, you know, you slowly become a, you know, a paraplegic and then your ability to, you know, breathe and, and talk and move anything other than maybe your eyes yeah. um, eventually is what happens. So it's so my dad had more of the more aggressive types, which uh, affected his hands first. So that's what his giveaway was. Actually, the, the bigger giveaway was his throat. So his was hands and throat first. His left hand started going weak. And then he was actually yelling at one of my football games. Uh, was our quarterback, and he yelled. To, he yelled at my lineman, "Somebody block!" And I guess when he yelled "block," his throat just cramped, and it took him right down to the bleachers. And my mom was like, "Jimmy, like, are you?" You know, he's like, "My, you know, my throat hurt." Well, it never, it never got better. And and after about so that would have been September, October of my senior year, uh, it was into winter time where he he sounded a little bit drunk, like he just had slur, had more of the slur. And it just wasn't getting any better, and so it wasn't until May until they actually were did they did a spinal tap to to rule out everything for him to make sure it wasn't MS and all these other things. And but yeah, so his so his started in his hands and in his throat, and then went to his legs, and that's what took him in around three years. But you have more of a, and then other people get it where it just starts in their legs first, correct? And then that they yeah, my, their life mine was really difficult. A lot longer. Yeah, mine was difficult to diagnose because I kind of. It started with my right hand, my right arm, and then it eventually went to my left arm, and then to my neck, and then kind of my legs and throat. It's been hitting, you know, lately. Um, and again, mine's on about a six and a half year, you know, almost seven year progression now. Yeah. So I feel very grateful that mine is slower progressing. Um, but still, you know, as of right now, I can't use either hand or arm. Um, you know, that's 
man, just the little things like being able to wipe your nose and scratch your face and just all the little things you do with your hands all day. Yeah. Um, it just makes sure, you know, really angry and frustrated and, you know, kind of lose a lot of your autonomy and your independence, which is, you know, another thing that ALS kind of robs you of. Yeah. Um, you know, so now I kind of, I get along in a wheelchair and most of the time with my family kind of push me around, but I'm able to walk and transition yeah. and still grateful that I can do that. But um, yeah, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a cruel disease that never stops and it kind of takes eventually everything except your mind. So yeah, thank goodness. And in my case, I'm very grateful that it's, you know, hitting my ability to speak yeah. and breathe last instead of first, which you know, prolong, prolongs your life. And, and also, you know, really most important thing for me to be able to communicate to people that I can still do that. So I'm very grateful. Well, that's why you're here in a lot of the way. I mean, you and I talked about that, right? It's like, how do we how do you, and I think when any, any man or woman dealing with stuff, right, it, if you're just going through it, it often just feels like suffering. Whereas if you can tie meaning into it, if you can create meaning, then all of a sudden it's just, it's pain. And I, I yeah. think there's a transition and I think human beings are, we can deal with pain, but suffering, like just pointless pain, it, it wears on us in a, in a way that's almost, uh, in, you know, intolerable. And so being here, that's a lot of the reason you were like, I want to come on here. I want yeah. to capture my voice. I want to create meaning and help other people too. And right. Heck yeah. Yeah. I look forward to these opportunities. I mean, get a little better. Like I don't like how my voice sounds anymore. And I know I'm going to get a little more emotional than I used to be. And I already was emotional, but yeah, if I can help somebody and it's really been um, healing for me to, to be able to speak about things and you know, Sorry. Um, reflect. I think, you know, that's that's one of the more valuable lessons I've learned. Is, you know, I, I think I was someone who would reflect now and then. And I definitely had a purpose, and I definitely had, you know, a gratitude about things, and you know, a plan for my life. But to really reflect on you know what's going on in your life and your relationship with your you know the people you care about your wife your kids co-workers family your relationship with god those are things i think that it's just very difficult when there's nothing wrong in your life and you're trying to you know win more games make more money you know everyone's out there striving and you know, I think a lot of times you don't take enough time to reflect and really, you know, appreciate what you have, um, prioritize things that are, you know, more important. I would say that the, the interesting thing that's happened that since my, you know, diagnosis and even before then when we knew something was wrong, but we didn't know it was something that would take my life. So there was already a expedited, I think, you know, gratitude and, hey, let's spend more time together and let's focus on the things that are important. And then when I got the diagnosis, you know, three years ago, that really hit home. And, you know, you, you quickly start to change the way you think and the things you prioritize and the things that are important to you. So I would say in the last three years that, you know, my relationship with my wife, my kids, you know, co-workers, family, you know, community members, my football team, they're all, those relationships are higher quality now. And, you know, I wish it didn't take something like that for me to get in that mindset to really do that. Yeah. So, you know, I guess that would be one thing that I would share with others is, you know, again, I don't think I was bad at it, but my intentionality about it, my having a purpose, my priorities are much more laser focused now. And I feel, you know, aligned with what's going to make me happy than before. So, you know, don't wait around for something like that, that we're all capable of, you know, changing our mindset and doing better in those areas without kind of that gentle nudge 
with something that's hard. But again, I, I through this experience, I really found gone from man, every day is hard and I hate it and it sucks. But much of it I wouldn't trade. Because believe me, it, it sucks, and I hate it, and it's brought me to my knees, and you know the depth of my you know sorrow and pain and anger and frustration is the highest it's ever been. But I also feel. Yeah. The lessons I've learned and the and the growth I've had as a person has been, you know, exponential. So I'm grateful for those those things. And I don't know. I'd like to think, you know, one day I'd have figured it out on my own. <laughs> but this hardship has really um, helped me in those ways. So every year, every year I try to have at least a day where I take something away for myself. So like, I try to like keep my hands still as, as much as I can. And dude, I just, uh, or I, I remember I tried to eat cereal once. Ugh. I forced myself to eat cereal without using my tongue, which I know sounds, but like to try to swallow without much of your tongue. And uh, it changed me, man. And like I, there's something about the process and that, that reality of you don't know what you got till it's gone. That's hard to replicate. If you just try to go there mentally, if you just try to think, well, what would I be like if I didn't have my eyesight you can't replicate not having eyesight. Like you can't replicate yeah. not having a voice. And so I think that we can attempt it and we can do our best to try to be grateful for what we do have. But the, the reality is the lessons you're learning are, are earned in the trenches, you know? Like that's, well, that's you, cool, can't, man. you can't, someone from a, you know, a Jew that survived Auschwitz, they can't, it's like they did it. Like that's their, that was their journey, yeah. you know? And you can't, it's to replicate that so hard. But at the same time, it doesn't mean we can't learn the lessons. And that's what my dad, the word I always use is my dad tattooed that relationships matter most into my soul. I mean, every, every letter I got, every, every, every I, I spoke to him once a month on my mission and would listen to his voice die over the course of my mission. And, and it was always shade and like, it's all about relationships. It's all about relationships. It's all that matters. It's all that matters. Don't forget. It's all that matters. And now, and now that's why I jumped into this field. You know, I, I came home from my mission and had some distractions from it, but it ultimately knew I like, I, I have to help relationships. And that's why I want to help men liberate themselves because it's relationships are all that matter in the end. So tell me more about, can you even try to explain what's gone on for you mentally or emotionally or spiritually that in in the process of knowing your that that your time is limited and and how that's a like i guess i'm trying to think if i'm listening to this right now so i'm someone driving in my car i'm listening to this podcast with these two dudes how do i what's something i can do to like try to get a better perspective because i'm sure i'm listening yeah. going man i do need to live like i'm dying better like i need to figure out how do i how do i live like i'm dying a little bit how do i you know yeah there's that famous song was it tim mcgraw yeah live like you're dying has oh, definitely dude. different meaning now but um yeah, and I, and I don't know. That's why I say that in some ways. As strange it may sound. You know, that there's a little bit of a, there's a gratitude there that I'm progressing towards a different mindset, a better mindset. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to think that, you know, we can get there 
without having a terminal disease. Certainly we can't. But there's things, you know, these hardships that come into our lives all the time. I think that's the, the one thing that I would say is if you change your mindset from why is this happening to me? This isn't fair. What's going on? I hate God. I hate life. This person, that, whatever. That to really grow as a person, you can't grow when you're in your comfort zone. You have to be in that, you know, that get out of your comfort zone and, and stretch and stray. And as humans, um, by nature, we don't want to do that. We want to just do just enough to get by. And there's obviously comfort there, but I don't think there's really joy there. You know, there's a difference to me. So, you know, my joys are greater than they used to be. Hmm. But certainly my sorrow and my the depth of my, you know, anger and sadness is more than, than, it, than it was ever before. And really that's been another, I think, blessing for me because, you know, if anyone knows me, I've always been a very positive person. The worst thing could happen to me the next time I'm over and I'm moving on. And I generally always had a good attitude and was happy and saw life as a great challenge and excited for the next day. And there's never been a time in my life once that I was depressed, that I was feeling the depths that I'm dreading the next day and, and, and how hard this is and, and feeling so, you know, sad for yourself and angry and all that, and all that comes with that. So, you know, I didn't really understand people who suffered with either mental illness or just depression or anxiety or, or how someone could get so down over things because I didn't. And I can really understand those people now. And, you know, you don't want to, you know, help them, connect with them. And there's actually a Harvard study on happiness that's gone on for about a hundred years now. It's passed on from even, you know, one per, you know, director to another. And they really wanted to study what really makes people happy. And I think they did it in New York and they had, you know, the elite who went to the highest colleges and were rich and made lots of money. And then the other half of the people were living in the slums and, the, you know, were immigrants and had nothing and were living in tenements and things like that. And they found that there was no difference in the, ha the amount of people that were happy that had life better that didn't, that the number one thing they found in this study was, again, this is over, you know, a long time. So they're studying spouses and kids and the generations that come from this. But the people that really prioritized your know, relationships and felt, you know, they had a good relationship with their wife and their kids. They had a few friends that they really could count on that they loved. That that was you know, the number one determining factor in happiness. And also what that did to their lifespan and their, you know, their overall health. Yeah. And, you know, people that, you know, prioritized, you know, whatever money, fame, power, getting more, doing more things that we think make us happy that they reported to be less happy than those who had less than them but you know yeah prioritize relationships so to me i think that's one of the, the keys for anybody that's struggling is you know look at the relationships in your life and start there how can i you know make them better and you know i think you know, two relationships that I felt. This might be contrary to what, I don't know if this is, you know, doctrine or what, but to me, I found the two relationships that matter the most are between me and God and me and myself. I think, you know, one of the things that the world's doing right now is really making people compare themselves to others. You know, it's so easy to do that now. Yeah. 
with you know social media everything's out there and i think you know when you really like yourself and you're working on yourself then all those other relationships you know will get better and you know in my case there's a lot of different ways i can do that but the one true way that i know always works is when that I feel close to God. That whatever, you know, whoever you think God is, whatever's your belief system, if you're following that, if you feel like that person's proud of you, if you feel like you're progressing to be a better person, then, you know, you're going to be happier. And you're going to like yourself better. And then when you like yourself, <laughs> sorry. you're fine, man. I think it's then you're a lot more capable and do a better job of loving others. You know, your wife, your kids, you know, other people. I think a lot of times people that really struggle with, you know, your relationships, it's because they first, they don't have a good relationship with themselves. So. Yeah. Why do you think that got you so emotional, like in yourself? That seemed to hit you pretty hard yeah. beyond ALS stuff. <laughs> well. Like, has this really pushed you to like you a lot more? Well, yeah, and there's also, you know, you definitely have your days where you just, and that's what's something I have to work on is that I hold myself to a high standard. Uh, so when I feel like I'm being, what was me, or I'm being, you know, resentful or angry or not, you know, bitter or not happy or, you know, worrying about the future, then I get a little... I get pissed at myself mm -hmm. and quit being freaking, you know, soft, quit being a wussy and, mm -hmm. you know, toughen up. And, you know, those, there's a lot of those days now, but, you know, forgiving yourself, Hey, you're doing the best you can. You got 1% better today, or you learned this lesson today. Um, I think, yeah, it goes a long way. Yeah. Plus I was just very blessed, you know, I had my parents sitting over there. Well, you know, growing up, I was certainly not a high achiever in the things that I cared about, sports mainly. Um, but I was always made to feel at home that I was amazing, that I was special. So I really did always have good self-confidence that I felt came from within, that I did like myself. And... You know, when something like this hits and you start doubting things and you're feeling angry and sad and you're starting to go into some darkness that you've never been before, um, that's a great challenge mm -hmm. to still like yourself and still be positive. And so you know, me... I, I fight with that every day still. It's certainly not something that, oh, you know, I've achieved this level of mindset. I'm good. Um, that's really, I think, the challenge of life. And I talked about, you know, maybe embracing hard things that, you know, the next day is going to be hard again. The next day is going to be hard again. But as you chip away at yourself and become better able to handle hard things, then you like yourself better. And I think in that definition of tough, would you say that you've had to allow yourself to learn that one of the toughest things to do is accept feeling weak? Like to yeah. just accept like, because yeah, you're, you're not used to feeling weak. The number one like thing before that this, I, yeah, like, yeah. I still get mad at it. I yeah. mean, I got mad at my parents getting out of the car because they're like treating me like a little kid and trying to <laughs> help me on the ice or whatever, which which I probably need. Yeah. But there's definitely a emasculating feeling when someone has to do everything for you. And, you know, you feel, you start feeling less. Definitely that's the, you know, along with just the 
pain of having a disease and the mental anguish and, you know, missing out on things and not, you know, thinking about future things you're not going to be able to do is all is hard. But in the moment of feeling, you know, less of a man, less of a person, um, I think that's why I got, you know, emotional yeah. because for the first time in my life that I can remember, I, you know, you start to dislike, you know, you know, yourself a little bit because of who you're becoming, because of the situation. And yeah. it's a battle every day to, you know, keep a good, healthy mindset and keep progressing yeah. and trying to be better. I want to go back to what you said just a couple seconds ago. You said it's emasculating for, for to, to, to watch people do things for you in that way. Like when you feel that you feel weak because it's like these, you know, I, I could do these things, but now I have to let, I have to let people do things for me. And I think the men that I work with and men in general, when we, when you struggle, and I guess I'm talking to them right now, right? And I want you, I wouldn't mind hearing your feedback on this. Cause if you struggle to feel confident, if you struggle to feel masculine, if you, if you struggle to feel strong and like, you're like, you're the man of your own, of your own life, the hero of your own life, maybe take a look at what people are doing for you that you're not doing. You know, if I, if I'm kind of blunt, because I think that the, at the heart and soul of masculinity is doing what you can do do like pick up the weight that you need to pick up in your life, pick up the responsibilities you need to pick up in your life. And then on the flip side of the table for me is someone who's saying, man, Shaden, yes. Cause when that gets taken from you, when now you don't even have a choice to pick that stuff up anymore, that's a battle in and of itself. And that's what I'm hearing from you where it's like, man, I've had to allow myself to feel masculine. I've had to allow myself to still be proud of myself, even though I'm not able to do the things I used to do anymore. Yeah. And it is, it's tough. Um, I think and one thing I've really learned and really already knew, but I didn't really think of it this way, that, you know, I grew up, so probably shouldn't have my parents over there. <laughs> Makes me cry. I grew up in a family where, you know, we all felt really loved and valued and the number one thing we did as well is, and we didn't have much. My dad's teaching high school and my mom's a stay at home mom. So we don't have much money. We never knew, knew that. You would think we're rich because I swear every damn batch of cookies we ever made, you know, we're giving to somebody else. So we're always, we're serving. Yeah. I grew up in a house where we're always trying to help someone else. And, you know, when you're younger as a kid, it's a little bit like, why are we doing this? Why don't we ever get it? You know, you don't really see it. And then all of a sudden you kind of, oh, hey, this makes me feel good. And then you kind of create a, you know, I guess a habit when you go on and you're an adult that you're doing those things and then you're teaching your kid to do those things. So that's always something that gave me good self-worth is how I felt serving and helping others and not being able to do that as much physically anymore is also hurt. But the one thing that I, you know, people have brought up to me is that, you know, even though it might be hard on me, that when people are doing things for me, who am I to rob them of that opportunity to feel good about themselves yeah. or they are serving someone else? So, you know, you know, I think that's growth as a, as a man too, is, is being able to realize that, hey, I need to let others need serve. Help. I need help. I, you know, when I'm receiving help, um, instead of looking at it as, you know, I'm less or I'm weaker, but I'm allowing someone else to serve me and it's making them feel good about themselves. And, you know, if making others feel good about themselves makes you feel better then having someone serve you shouldn't do that to you as much as it did initially to me. It was very, you know, I would get if someone was trying to help me do anything that I felt I could still do, like I would hold on to the like until there's no way I could do it anymore before I would ask for help. And, you know, I more readily ask for help now. A, it just gets so tiring to try to do all these things for yourself. And just, you know, seeing my boys and my wife and my loved ones. And I feel the The joy and happiness that I see it brings them known, they really helped me out. And, yeah. You know, back to relationships. I think 
<laughs> there's nothing that really can either strengthen or weaken a relationship like shared sorrow. So I feel fortunate that in my case, you know, shared sorrow has really strengthened my relationship. So if allowing someone else to do something for you increases your relationship and your bond with them and it makes them feel better, then maybe I've had an incorrect mindset in being so bothered by that most of my life, especially when, you know, this hit and I was a very independent person that had the mindset, no matter how bad something is, I can get through it, I'll work, I'll figure it out, you know, and there's maybe a little too much of I can do this in there instead of, you know, we can do this and I need some help to do this. Yeah, man. I mean, men in particular, we, well, it's just, we suck. We suck at asking for help. That's just the facts. And, and for, and sometimes for good reason, but most of the time it's yeah. just, it's just pride when so many people could be benefited by, by you asking for help. Therapy is one of them. That's for sure. Yeah. So what's been one of the more, I, I sent you a text last night. What's, what's been one of the more liberating experiences you've had through all this liberating meaning you felt stuck. You know, I, I, my phrase I use is liberating the captive around here. And so maybe a place where you felt stuck and, and, uh, felt a lot of liberation by some kind of experience or mindset or and what that was. Yeah. Well, you and I have talked about this and probably my, you know, one of my biggest hangups fears has been, you know, the fear of the future. And I've never felt that in my life. I always can't wait for the future. Things are going to be better. Things are going to be good. You know, I'm going to accomplish this. We're going to do this. I can't wait for this to happen. Whereas, you know, when you start realizing your reality is every day is going to be harder and my life on earth is numbered and there's a chance I won't see my kids, you know, grandkids and I'm not going to be able to have them five bucks after a game like my dad does for my kids or seeing married or just, you know, going on vacation with your wife or, you know, all the things that you kind of look forward to as, you know, your kids get older and life, um, you know, starts going to this different phase where, you know, it really is beautiful and exciting. And I looked forward to that. So the liberating thing, I guess, would be is that I was so caught up on missing those things that that was a lot of my deep seated you know, sorrow. And because I'd always had a mindset up, I'll figure this out, I'll make it better, that I went, I went about doing that. Every diet imaginable, every medicine, every holistic doctor, you know, researching this, we're going to do that, we're going to do this. And we're going to get through this and we're going to get better and we're going to find a cure. We're going to slow it down. And it's, it's like trying to solve an unsolvable Rubik's cube. You know, after a while, it just beats you down and you realize really there's nothing I can do. This thing is just going to go at whatever rate it's going to go. Yeah. And your life's going to end whenever it's going to end. And, you know, so that was, you know, caused me a lot of pain and anguish. So the liberating part would be to let go. Yeah. You know, in my case, my belief in God. Yeah. You know, eternal life. And there's a plan. So, and again, I'm still working on this. I mean, I still have conversations in my head all the time about how hard this is and, and you need to work to get to that point where you can really, you know, let go and just trust in God and his plan for you that when I'm, you know, when this disease hit, it's not going to be that I get up to heaven like, well, if you would have just tried this diet or you would have just mm -hmm. tried this medicine or if you had just found this doctor, then you could have saved, like, why didn't you figure it out? Like I kind of felt that way for a while, a lot of pressure that we got to like figure this thing out and make it better. And how are we going to, you know, stave off some of these bad things that are coming as opposed to hey we're not going to stop doing those things 
but because I think there's great value in, you know, battling sure. and, and scrapping and trying to figure something out. But then, you know, after I've done you know, everything I can to just trust, hey, whenever you're supposed to go, that's where you're going to go. And there's nothing you can really do to change that, yeah. to live in the moment and be present and, you know, enjoy going to your son's basketball game tonight because who knows when you'll be able to not be able to go to him anymore. So I guess that fear of the future is really what I'm working on of letting go and liberating myself to, hey, all you can do is your best and you can't control the results. You can only control, you know, yeah, you know, which is what trust. You do. And that trust really is, is hard. And so it's been one of those things where if you really believe what you believe, then you shouldn't be so sad and you should be more present. Yeah. And you should trust more and let go that, you know, whatever is best for you is what's going to happen yeah. if, you know, you're doing your part. So that's uh, still a challenge. But to me, when I have that mindset, I'm much more able to live in the moment and not be you know, fearful of the future, sad or angry about, you know, being robbed of, you know, because there, there's this definite feeling of, you know, life's not fair. You're being robbed of something that's really important to you and there's nothing you can do to change it. That's a, that's a very difficult pill to swallow. Yeah. So, um, but I think the liberating, you know, feeling of just, you know, trusting that things will work out and making the best of each day um, really has helped me find you know, more happiness than I thought. Because I'm not, I mean, I, I think I've mentioned this to you before in counseling that I think has really been eye-opening to me. I, when I first got my diagnosis, I was actually very grateful because I knew that ALS takes your life in two to three years. So when you get told by someone, hey, you got like probably at least 10, then there's this, oh, okay, 10's a lot better than two. True. I'm so grateful. But, you, but you're, I didn't really realize what's going to happen to my body and how quickly it's going to happen. It's one thing to be alive. It's another thing to be able to do the things you love. And those, the losses to my, my physical strength have come a lot faster than I thought would happen in my mind. And, you know, in my mind, when I could no longer use my hands and I couldn't feed myself or bathe myself or go to the bathroom by myself or drive or just, you know, all the things that come with that. I thought that I would be miserable and wish I was dead. And like, I really dreaded that day coming. And so for that day to come a lot sooner than I thought, I'm actually, you know, very grateful and happy. And I guess, you know, in a weird way, proud of myself and my family that that's not the case. That I'm very happy. Yes, I have numerous times throughout the day where I'm sadder than I've ever been before or angrier than I've been. But I'm finding lots of happiness and joy and I look forward to the next day. So that's been a blessing and something that comforts me that as things get harder, you know, I thought I couldn't handle this. And, I, and I'm being able to handle it. And when I say me, I'm only handling it because of those relationships yeah. and God's help. But so it gives me hope that when things even get harder and I think, well, there's no way I could deal with that, that hopefully I can deal with it because, you know, I'm practicing dealing with it right now. Yeah, if I had started a counter, man, I should have brought my pitch, my pitch counter for the amount of times you said gratitude or grateful today. <laughs> be pretty high i think for you you know anyone listening that's that's a lesson in and of itself that uh yeah if eric can if eric's the one teaching us how to be grateful you know what have you been grateful for today you know i think it's amazing how trials do that because they force you to, you're going to be bitter or you're going to be better right like there, there's only like one one or one way about yeah. it and so gratitude's that that powerful mechanism of allowing things to be as they are rather than always wishing that they, they were a different way, you know, and 
and then that's that's synonymous with acceptance and trust like gratitude acceptance trust like they're they're all best friends right they, they all live together and they create a powerful a powerful mindset a powerful life that that again why i wanted you on here too so much is i only find it in people who know that death is that they they know when they'll kind of know when they're going to die and the irony is i could die tomorrow like no one knows my brother-in-law a few years ago he died out of nowhere you know just heart attack, healthy guy bought a pharmacy pharma, pharmacy up in star valley we moved him in and two weeks later bam gone 43 years old it's like you don't know yeah and we don't really live with that mindset of hey could be any day i better make the best of the day and that's that's i guess when i say a blessing is for me kind of know we i had this discussion with my wife because it's i mean the the negative thing about als would be it's like you go through the the you know the grieving cycle over and over hey two yeah. weeks ago i could scratch my own nose and now i can't and so then you're very angry and mad and sad that you can't do that anymore and then you accept it and you move on. And then the next, you know, a week later, something you could do, you couldn't do. And then you couldn't do. So there's this just constant grind, the ALS, like it's just relentless, like take, take, it just keeps taking from you and taking from you. And the moment you kind of get okay with how you are, then something else goes. So that would be the very, you know, the, the hardest thing about it, I think. But on the other hand, you know, I've talked, well, I could also, let's say I've got whatever, 15 more years on this life. You know, what if then nothing happened to me, I'm, everything's going fine, and just 15 from years from now, I'm skiing, I hit a tree, and I die. I would rather have these last 15 years being hard. <laughs> a, because of the lessons I've learned about B, because it's kind of a blessing to know your days are numbered. Make the most of today. It definitely changes. Yeah. You know your mindset as opposed to what you said. You know it could be the end of it for any of us someday. So the blessing of kind of knowing, even though that comes with a lot of agony, it also is a there's a lot of tender mercies that come with that as well. Yeah. So I wouldn't trade it. It's awesome. <laughs> Um, you mentioned, you know, gratitude. So I would say I was always try to be a pretty grateful person. But now gratitude to me, it's it's me being selfish, knowing that if I'm not grateful, you know, there's a famous quote, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but basically that gratitude is the mother of all good attributes. That there's nothing good that can come if you're not first grateful. And so I know for me to selfishly get through the day that I have to be grateful. And so, you know, there's been many times when you don't feel grateful and you have to, you know, find every little thing that you can be grateful about. And, you know, as the more that I study grip and toughness is, you know, we think people become tough because they've been punched in the face and downtrodden and eventually they get stilled and hardened and calloused and then they become tough. And I think that's really a fallacy. And I think a lot of men think that, hey, if I just, you know, deal with it mean and tough and I don't share my feelings that I'm gonna become this, you know, tough, resilient person. But the toughest and the most grittiest people, that's fueled by love. You know, they love others, they feel love. They love what they're doing um, and gratitude. So I would say, to me, a much tougher person be someone who's really grateful and loves what they're doing and loves others and feels love. That person, to me, is going to battle, you know, a lot better and longer and harder than someone who feels downtrodden and calloused and, you know, alone and no one believes in them. And I'm going to rise up and I'm going to show you because I've been in that place too, yeah. you know, and, and those are feelings I had. Maybe you're trying to make a football team or you're trying to, you know, perform well in a sport and there's definitely room for that and i and i think that there's that part of grit that i still have and i hold on to and like you know f that i'm gonna go do this i can do it but no matter how tough we think we are um you know if we don't have you know that love and gratitude eventually 
we're going to falter because it's, it's just us and not that filling up being supported, um, you know, by others, which I think really fuels that grit. So awesome, man. Yeah. You have an authority. Hey, can we take one little break here? Yeah. And just, yeah, I'm going to have my mom come and wipe my nose here. Just kind of wipe the mustache part. No, it's just kind of a constant little drip. I don't think I got. I'm sorry, you got that from me. Well, it's the weather too, but we're an hour in. Do you want to keep going? You want to? Um, what time is it right now? We're at 10:50. Ooh, um, I get going. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm sorry. Yeah, I got physical therapy today at 11. Okay. So we better go. Maybe that's a good place to end. And you can think about, you know, what you want to talk about next time. And, you know, this stuff like this is enjoyable for me. So, yeah. And my mom and dad can get me here. Yeah. Let me just close it out for a second so we can have a Mm -hmm. good ending to it. Okay, mom, I'm good. Let them finish up here. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Well, we just took a short break to uh, wipe Eric's nose and give him water. So the next time you uh, blow your own nose and give yourself a drink, I just want you to think about what that'd yeah. be like if you needed help, because that's the that's what this does. And uh, so we're gonna we're gonna close here. And I I just want to say thanks again for being here. I it's such a great reminder for me about relationships. The the word acceptance and trust and obviously gratitude is a it's just again resoundingly powerful and when you study the lives of people who endure hard things it's always the same it is you can read every book all these every you study these people that's what's uh that's what comes out in them and so those things are in our control we don't need a diagnosis to be able to to choose to focus on those things and so i hope if you as you listen to this today that you've internalized some of that and i hope you'll take a second and actually make a plan for yourself and and honestly repent, like change, like do something different to say, you know what? I have been complaining a lot. I've been, I don't intentionally try to have gratitude and and do something about it. Find some accountability and uh, it'll change your life. I promise. So thanks for listening. And uh, we'll have Eric on here again. All right. Thanks, Shay. Yeah.